lagoon and there's a mouth. At the mouth of the lagoon stands Coast Guard vessel. That shows who is in control of Panatag Shoal. No one can come in without their permission. So they call the shots. And sad part about it, Panatag Shoal is more than 100 nautical miles from Masindo. And from China, 400 nautical miles. So whose EEZ is it? Ours or theirs? Simple math. Did you get the answer, please? And can you take it over wherever you go as to what these two journalists have found and are telling you about what is going on in the West Philippine Sea? Yes. You see, my own opinion here is that the administration thinks it's journalists who are upset about this. The administration doesn't think that you are upset about this. And that is why it has continued to sustain in all kinds of stupid statements as to what it is allowing on our waters. Thank you for that question and thank you for the two journalists who thank have just given us a quick crash course on how we should look at these issues. And let me apologize, I have been rushing things because I thought we would have only until 11 and now we're going over time. I'm sorry I have just been scolded by the project officer that I have until 11.30. So, the only one question per person still, so I'm sorry still to the gentleman who went over there. Can you, if there are any other people, three on each side, I think we can manage, right, panel? Yes, three on each other side. Whose turn is it now, Le Lawrence? Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, Three hello. on each side. <laughs> I'm Jelena Hernandez, a journalism student from Kalayaan College. And my question can be answered by any of the panelists. My question is, when reporting on the killings, the extrajudicial killings that come as a result of the drug war, do you take into consideration that there may be children who may get traumatized as a result of your report. Children. Define children, how children. You are a child when I look at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> From where I am, yes. Because I think that a lot of children already have access to the internet uh, because this is, a, this is a different age of you know what I mean. Trying to understand your question, I'm sorry. Children, as children who have to be guarded by their parents as to what they watch, or young people like yourselves, no? Def let, let ask, are you worrying about how such uh, material will affect? Maybe about teenagers, seguro, or? Teenagers. Pat, you want to venture? <coughs> Malu. If, if I get it right, well, we, we did a story early on, year one of the war on drugs, and talked to teachers and parents and how it's all uh, being received by their children. It's, uh, very blood and gore video on, on television, uh, stories they hear in the community. But I think it's a real problem that uh, first off, you have child victims of the war on drugs. And that's a fact. And the government and the police will have to be called out for that. Kian is one of the stories that the PCIJ story project did uh, through Sheila's team. And it, it really generated a lot of uh, concern from people and somehow compelled the president to stop the war at least for a brief period of time. Children are also witnesses. Children are also the uh, people who had lost father or mother so the story will have to come to them at some point. I think it is in the telling of the story that there should be caution so that instead of trauma, they could be made to understand exactly what happened and be more clear about uh, this is not acceptable. This is not an everyday thing that should be passed off as normal. So, but, but I guess we have a real problem. We, we talked to the teachers and they were saying, 
how do you teach children the, the story of uh, killing people? And the president is the one saying it on and on on television. We have problems with people from TV saying, how do you bleep a president when on live TV he curses? So it's, it's, it's a problem with educators, I guess. Our conversation has turned so vicious and so... Um, I mean, it, it's really not, it's so, so vile, and I don't think this is the way we should teach our children uh, to listen and to study and actually to be fair in their dealings with people. Did you want to say anything, Pat? Okay, in terms of like worrying about the trauma, um, are you also worried then about how Mr. Duterte might be traumatizing an entire generation? Yes. For and, and nobody bleeps him. Yes. Yes. For I hope you are. I think that um, it sets a bad example for the, for the children that it's okay to kill. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have you. <coughs> Please. Ah, magandang umaga po. Po si Kurt mula sa Universidad ng Pilipinas, Los Baños. Ang tanong ko po ay, in, in these challenging times for journalism in which was earlier stated that you are under attack. Para kanino pa po yung pamamahayag ninyo? Para ano? May iksing sagot para po sa inyo. Para po sa inyo. So yun ang sagot. Meron ka pang gustong tanungin sa ibang, hindi ibang question ha. Meron ka pang gustong tanungin sa na panel na sumagsugot sa iyo? Parang ano po? Uh, Parang kanino? Uh, what are your personal advocacies as journalists? Okay, sorry. That's a second question okay. and I was already, <laughs> I already cut out. Okay. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Next. Salamat. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning po. Ako po si John Archie Balmes from Polytechnic University of the Philippines, a journalism student. So my question is, for specifically for Mr. Christian Esguera. So you said earlier that it is the job of the journalist to explain to people what is happening in politics. So my question is, how do you actually explain these things to Filipino people if in the first place, most of Filipino people do not have the access to proper information and education to that? Tsaka sinabi nyo rin po na may uh, kakulangan tayo mga journalist uh, hindi, nyo, um, hindi rin po ba na uh, mas malaki yung kakulangan ng mismong gobyerno dahil yung um, mga tao mismo ay walang uh, access sa edukasyon at hindi nila naintindihan kung ano nga ba ang tunay na nakapaloob sa politika. Okay, anong problema ito, hey, Christian? But, but uh, I'd like to limit my answer because the, the problem is so complicated. Yep. You can blame the family, the schools, the church, education institutions. I'd like to focus on the failings of media. It's very important for us to explain the proper context of things, not just in politics, but in any story that we tackle. Because um, there, there's always a context and a moral in any story. I always tell that to the students. But in this case, when you talk about explaining issues, first, you need to make sure that you understand it. So as a journalist, you have to put something in your head, meaning substance. Because it's, this is what I realized when I moved to television. I'm sorry for being frank. I used to criticize tele television a lot because my training was in print for 15 years. And some of my criticism of the television media, actually many of them were confirmed when I joined. <laughs> One of that, it's very easy to look good and to look smart in front of the camera. And that will make you look smart to the audience. You'll get a lot of fans on social media. But that's fakery. So for you to be able to address that very basic question that you're asking now, you have to start now. You have to read a lot. When I say you read a lot, I'm not just talking perfunctorily that you have to read. Well, we hear that in school, diba? Guys read a lot. But the people who tell you to read a lot don't actually read. So I, I, I have to be very, very brutally honest to you and all, to all the students here. There's still time. Read a lot of books. Along the way, you will develop the 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 liking for better books and better options. And then that's the time that you're investing basically. So the time that you need to explain things to the public, you understand. For example, it's very, if I may share, 
nung, nung election, um, I, I did an, a very simple, I hope that was simple, because I came from the inquiry, medyo highbrow yung broadsheet eh. So, medyo pang matalino daw, quote unquote, di ba? So, so that was the, the training I had. Pero during the campaign, the basic question that I had, we always talk about voting smart and uh, uh, voting wisely, but how, how do you make sure that we vote wisely? I, I, I decided to do an explainer in Filipino. Uh, ano ba yung trabaho ng senador? Because ang daling sabihin, bumoto tayo smart, pero naiintindihan man natin trabaho ng senador. Let's say someone files an impeachment complaint against the president and by some miracle, it progressed and there was an actual impeachment trial. It'd be surprised that the likes of Manny Pacquiao, Bongo, Bato de la Rosa will become senator judges. Why do I know? Why do I feel passionate? I'm not demeaning their capability, but the point is, you might be surprised. Wait, binoto ko sila for for a senator. Pero ano ba yung trabaho ng senator? Lawmaker, di ba? Pero there are many other jobs of a senator. I realized that because when I covered the 2012 impeachment trial of Renato Corona, a lot of my colleagues in the media were surprised. Bakat sila to lapit na karub? Pre, judge yan. Senate impeachment trial. So these things, you would be surprised because sometimes we in the media are very much uh, cloistered in our own cocoon. We understand each other. Pero we fail to actually reach out to the people. Parang masyado tayong nagiging ano, di ba? Yung parang masyadong mayabang na, hindi, naiintindihan na yan. That, that's a very dangerous presumption, which brings me back to my point kanina. Huwag tayong magalit pag yung mga tao mali yung binoboto because we also failed miserably with our task. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, can I just add to Christian's marvelous uh, comment? Uh, uh, now we have time. Pero, ano, I'd just like to add to that. Na, ano, na, uh, it, it's easy to blame government, and of course, government's part of the problem. But in the end, alamo, we've, we've basically lost the value of reading. And, and I don't mean reading Facebook. Ah. Uh, even reporters, they don't read newspapers anymore. Uh, uh, oh, I mean TV. I don't need to read newspapers. In TV, you have one and a half minutes to explain taxes or the peace talks. No, you have to read newspapers. Pa rin eh. And people have lost that value. Instead, they think that Facebook is a newspaper. It is not. And that is something we have lost clearly. And that's something we're trying to regain. So reading, reading, reading. Um. Yes. Hello, good morning. I'm Alba Santos from Verapiles. Uh, itugog ko na lang po yung question ko dun sa last question. And sana banggit po ni Sir Ed na Facebook. Um, uh, paan, gaanong, uh, paano po ba natin i-concern? Yes, um, ano po yung concern natin as journalists bilang truth tellers tayo sa misinformation and disinformation on social media? Especially ngayon, kami po sa Verapiles, marami kami na monitor na uh, bogus Facebook pages, spreading lies about polit politicians. Meron na nga ngayon, as early as now, campaigning na sila, prepping na sila for the 2022 elections. Bilang journalist po, paano po kayo concern sa misinformation, disinformation para sa susunod na election po natin sa 2022? Okay. The continuing issue of fake news I think in all the student forums I've attended, inuulit ko, I, I think it's important to look at disinformation and misinformation as real problems. But it doesn't have to be just a, let's say, verification of uh, uh, by desktop. But actually, the real an antidote should be to do good journalism and, and not, you know, point by point, a story per story. Because my concern there is uh, the term fake news was coined by Donald, Donald Trump. I mean, against the storied newspapers of the world like New York Times, Washington Post, or TV, CNN. The problem is it, it confuses people because news is not supposed to be fake. I worry that it diminishes journalism. We're supposed to be tested for accuracy and fairness and uh, ascertaining the truth, not giving people absolute truth. So when people say fake news, fake news, I worry that people will think that every sloppy report, every error in spelling or grammar that we do would be considered fake news. On the other hand, government should not be begrudged for doing PR, I think. But my problem is, let's take the whole deal. Disinformation, misinformation, important problems. But let us not mask the other issues of impunity, of uh, bad reporting, 
of failure of newsrooms to take leadership and management roles in a situation when the press is under attack. So I, I hope it answered in some way. Thank you. Speaking of the elections in 2022, how many of our audience are going to be voting age by then? Raise your hands. How many are registered at this point? All right. The mobilization for 2022 cannot come earlier and let this be the beginning because you have the numbers, guys. You are and can change the election in 2022. Ma'am? Ma'am? A quick one. Sorry, Shamuena. Pero may add important I'll, about I'll, the election. Go ako, ahead. Ako quick one lang. Uh, I'll be wearing my other hat as a Facebook user in answer to the previous question. Uh, as a user, I, I don't have second thoughts calling out friends once they share, take information. I think you should do too. Call out the fake news. Call out your friends and say, fake, do not share. How did you share that, etc.? You wanted to add? In brief uh, addition, lang, since we're talking about the 2022 elections, assuming there would be elections, but I hope there would be. Um, <laughs> there will be elections. <laughs> My point is one important thing that I think every journalist should realize is that especially when you cover politics, you should not be partisan. You should not be any one side's political raraboy. Because I noticed this special in social media. Sometimes you get too attached to the people that you cover. Let's say you cover the, the people of Noy Aquino. And then without that critical mindset, you tend to, to embrace everything that they tell you. Because hey, that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. And then when you cover the, the president and his uh, raraboys, you tend to imbibe or gain their, their perspective of things. So what, that, what does that make you? That makes you a parrot journalist. Taga parrot ng sinasabi from ng one side. And any self-respecting journalist is not supposed to do that. That's why we can go even to the coverage of, of campaigns because I think campaigns are very important. Sometimes I, 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 I feel passionately whenever I see fellow reporters covering, kasi sa, sa, if, for your information, Yung mga news organizations, they assign reporters to cover specific candidate. Minsan nagkakaroon Stockholm Syndrome eh. So sometimes, I remember before, nung 2010, nakagano na yung mga tao eh. Iba naman, nakagano na rin, di ba? So that will affect your credibility at the very least. All right, thank you for the term, parrot journalists. A lot of them doing simply the repeating and the parroting of what their subjects say. I have a, which one? On the other side, yes, please. Hi, um, this goes out to our Batikang journalists who, who have been in the industry for years already. Has the intimidation continued to intensify from previous administration, if there is any, to the time Duterte took office and up to this date? We know Pia Renada being banned from covering Malacanang, attacks directed to Vera, Vera Files, specifically Ellen Tordesillas, allegedly okay. linking to the matrix to stabilize the government. What other forms of intimidation have you experienced as, as a journalist? And does the media do anything to counter these attacks? Or tinatanggap na lang na natin na wala, trabaho natin eh. Okay, I will limit the answers to about three of you, if you wish, and very quickly so. Any other forms of intimidation and what do you do? Sometimes they call you out publicly. Um, I did a story about the, um, the swarming of Chinese maritime militia around Pagasa Island. Uh, there was a PowerPoint presentation. I had the slides. So I had facts to back it up. I came out with it. The next day, uh, Secretary Sal Panelo called me out on his daily press briefing, essentially calling me a liar and someone who's just out to get famous. Uh, that, that reporter, Zambrano, yung tawag niya sa akin. Um, so what I did was to ask for the transcript of his briefing, go back to my PowerPoint slides, and just come out with another story that has both of them. So who? I don't have time to make a PowerPoint slide that says from the Western Command. Um, I just let the facts speak for themselves. And 
I don't need to defend myself. And not, none of us have to defend ourselves at a personal level. But it feels that way a lot sometimes. Um, yung sometimes you think when you get attacked by trolls, you can easily disregard it because number one, you're not even sure if they're real people. They're probably not. And number two, even if they were real people, you have no idea who they are. So why should you care what they think? But we're discounting the human effect of a relentless troll attack. I thought, that I cover wars. I've, I've seen darker stuff. But I was a victim also of a relentless month-long attack. Um, and I was abroad at the time, living by myself. And the laki ng realization ko na... Thank you. This is, a, this is a really powerful... <laughs> this is a really powerful tool that they're using. Um, just discrediting you, insulting you relentlessly. It's, it has a psychological power on a journalist. And none of us will admit that they've lost that fight. But uh, speaking for myself, it hits you where it hurts. And you can either just crawl back into your shell and say, ayoko na, hirap pala nito. Or you can use that to toughen yourself up and say, sige, ayun lang pala, sige pa, keep it coming. Okay, I think that was a rather comprehensive response to the question how you deal with these kinds of attacks and intimidation. Yes, thank you. Thank and you. the last question for this session. Hi, good morning. My name is Chantal Palioran from Miriam College. Well, first of all, I just want to say that your bravery is something that I will forever aspire to live by. I guess it's true when they say that not all heroes wear capes, is that what they say? So um, day by day, as journalists, I'm sure that your integrity is challenged. So I just want to ask this more personal question. How do you cope up with the idea that one day you might get killed because of something that you've published? Can I speak uh, for myself? I think um, there's, there's this sense of... Um, romanticism or mysticism about the so-called brave journalist. Actually, we should perish the thought that it's really about bravery. It's really about chasing stories and doing it well. And sometimes you get into trouble, but actually that is not the point. The point is really to make people read or know or learn about stories important to all of us. There would be risks. But I think this is not a question of, uh, I just would like to disabuse your thought that you have to be so brave to be able to do good reporting. You will have to be very methodical, very meticulous, very industrious, and diligent to be able to be a good journalist. I mean, the bravery is something that uh, I think is, uh, well, in the face of threats and attacks under this administration, level one, it's really about the individual. Committing to do good journalism, and believing that you know this is not personal, we are, we're not against this president, but we're after doing good reporting. Second, the support of the institution, your colleagues in the newsroom, your editors, your news managers, they have to be there behind you. They have to say that uh, we will be supporting you all the way. And finally, I think that support of the community. We'd like you to keep faith in the media, that we're a publicly good thing, that we mean well, we don't want to polarize further. I think this, this panel has communicated that as much. We're here to tell stories. It's not really about us proving ourselves to be brave. It, of course, it could be frightening, and it will probably not stop. We're all preparing maybe, or we should be preparing maybe for the situation that gets very acute. I mean, I, I don't know when it will come or whether it will come, but when it happens, that will be possibly total breakdown or absolutely no more press freedom. That we have to prepare for. But in the meantime, we have to stand our ground, continue doing good reporting, and chase after stories, not war medals or martyrdom. We have to keep surviving to write another day. So no journalist is worth uh, no death or... No story. no story is worth dying for, actually. <laughs> so 
You don't need a dead journalist. You need journalists who will do good journalism. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And with that last question and last answer, I will put the first part of our program to a close. We shall have a five-minute break. Five minutes. Please be back, and we will have our presentation announcements. Our panel then will go and go back to the table. And please give them a warm round of applause for a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>